Hello and welcome. I'm Peter Afrasiabi, host of the Curious Lawyer series. I'm a partner at the law firm of One LLP in Newport Beach, California, and the Curious Lawyer series, as you see on this slide, is really a fun, educational, entertaining walk through different areas of the law. We take different substantive areas, such as we look at the CIA or we look at dogs, and then we see the intersection of these fun, interesting topics with various legal regimes in order to give you updated education on the law. So, for example, CIA law, we've walked through the administrative state, we've walked through constitutional law, we've walked through freedom of information, domestic and foreign spying, those types of legal topics, all under the umbrella of the CIA. Dog law, you learn about contract, property, some trusts in the state, criminal problems that come up with our furry friends. Celebrity and paparazzi law is another example that lets you walk through copyright and the like. So, the curious lawyer today is bringing you football law. Now, what does that mean? We will be looking at various areas of the law, as you see on our slide here, principally the Sherman Act. These are the antitrust laws in the United States. And so we will be looking at antitrust laws as they apply to the NFL and professional sports in general, but particularly the NFL and football. And we will explore then how America's favorite sport has intersected with the legal regime. So at the end of this program, you will be an expert at your next legal cocktail party or bar event on everything to do with the legal regime surrounding football in our country. This requires us to look at the Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961 and the massive changes that came about during JFK's era in terms of creating the legal foundation that ultimately has led to what the NFL is today. We'll look at the antitrust battles that led to the creation of the Sports Broadcasting Act and we'll look at the subsequent antitrust battles that have ensnared the NFL, including the big USFL versus NFL case in the 1980s, which had a star appearance by Pre President Donald Trump. We'll look at a sidebar, some baseball antitrust law, because baseball, like football, has some antitrust exemptions, but it's in a particularly rarefied area that you will see. And we'll also look at some of the more modern issues that deal with the football concussion litigation that's erupted, and then settlements and structures designed to protect fo professional football players, which you'll see some fascinating historical data that shows this concern with safety goes all the way back to the time of Teddy Roosevelt. And we'll end with a walk through right of publicity law, where we see how football intersects with name, image, and likeness law, which is another way of saying right of publicity law, in terms of what happens to our student athletes and are they able to monetize their name, and image, and likeness. So let's get started. And as you see on the next slide here, we're going to look at the Sherman Act. This is section one of the Sherman Act, and this is the important uh, quote and statute that we will be seeing repeatedly today as we walk through the antitrust issues that have afflicted the NFL. Every contract, combination in the form of trust or otherwise, or conspiracy in restraint of trade or commerce among the several states or with foreign nations is declared to be illegal. This is the root nature of what the Sherman Act is and what the antitrust laws under Section 1 of the Sherman Act are designed to protect against, and that is contracts that restrain trade um, are deemed to be illegal. Now, that language, of course, has led to Supreme Court and judicial interpretation, and for purposes of Section 1 of the Sherman Act, there is what's known as the rule of reason. And courts have imposed this rule of reason standard such that it only applies to unreasonable restraints on trade or commerce. So not every contract that restrains trade or commerce is per se illegal. It, the courts have applied this rule of reason standard. And so the goal of this standard is to ask the fact finder to ultimately balance the pro-competitive and the anti-competitive effects of any contractual restraint. And so what courts look at and assess when conducting this analysis is a, you know, a variety of factors, which include principally the following four, as you see here. We must first define the relevant product and the geographic market, or in the modern age, the internet market, for example. We have to assess to understand the market power of the defendants in that relevant market. We have to assess the existence of anti-competitive effects. And we have to assess and analyze the intent in this restriction that exists. 
The defendants can also put forward evidence of an objective pro-competitive justification for the contract at issue, the restraint in trade at issue. Now, what's critical here, and you see this comes from you know, many Supreme Court cases. We, we took just one of them, the Continental Television Incorporated versus GTE Sylvania Incorporated case which is a 1977 Supreme Court case reported, as you see, at 433 U.S. 36. And this basic principle that runs through the case law is that courts must, in the analysis they're conducting, distinguish between restraints that have an anti-competitive effect that are harmful to consumers versus restraints that are stimulating competition that are actually in the consumer's best interest. And so we are concerned with figuring out here whether the consumer is being harmed or whether what's actually occurring is something that even if it's a restraint that may be damaging a company, it's ultimately beneficial to the consumer in terms of lower prices and better access to goods and services. And so this critical focus in terms of where are these effects being felt and who is feeling them is one of the massive fault lines that runs through the law, which we'll see as we start walking through our program here. So in order to get started, let's go back in time. And what we want to do is have a factual understanding of the history of football, both as a sport in the United States and also how it intersects with the legal regimes that may be regulating it in order for us to understand the antitrust litigation that we will be looking at today. So if we go back, let's go back in history, we'll go back to the 1860s. And that's roughly the time that football as we know it today at least started. And then it started in college and it was a different form of the sport. It wasn't exactly the sport that we watch today, but it was the early precursor of the sport. Now, by the early 1900s, there had been innumerable deaths. It was particularly violent in terms of the impact on people. It was a different game the way it was played in terms of the rules and it was much more physical with mashups of people colliding and so there were profound injuries. And in 1909, the, the problems had become so significant um, that there had been about 19 deaths just that year in, in college football. And so there was a massive public outcry, and then more and more people were actually talking about ab, you know, abolishing football. And so there was a football abolition movement afoot in order to get rid of it. And so Teddy Roosevelt, who was a big fan of football from his college days, um, held a summit, really, to sort of, as he injected himself into into the early version of what we'd call, I guess, the NCAA rules today, but it was sort of the private elite schools back east. And he held a summit and he wanted to establish a set of rules that would make it safer um, for the football players in order to enable the sport to continue to exist and grow without you know, leading to this, the horrific injuries and deaths that were occurring on, on, a, on a pretty significant scale when you think about that number of deaths in just one year, for example, and it was rinse repeat year after year. And so the new rules that came out of the Teddy Roosevelt summit were that the yardage needed for a first down was doubled from five to 10. And this sort of facilitated less mashups as, you know, in terms of people colliding as they would try to you squeeze out one yard, two yards. Um, it, it pushed the game wider, in other words. A neutral zone was created between the two sides on the line of scrimmage. And this sort of facilitated also a slight less physicality. The flying wedge, which was a formation of the time, was banned um, by requiring you know, six men to be on the line. And then one of the big changes that happened, which sort of really led in some sense, many at least sports football historians believe, to sort of the game as we know it today, was that the forward pass was established, which really facilitated spreading the field and moving the ball down the field by passing um, and running and passing as opposed to colliding um, in, this, in the scrimmage area. And so that then happens in 1909. And so by 1923, the NFL existed and it had a set of rotating teams and it was primarily in the Northeast and the Midwest. And by the 1950s, we have the first antitrust litigation being brought by the Department of Justice against the NFL related to broadcasting restrictions. And that's the case law that we will start looking at shortly. But just to keep the context of our timeline, let's keep walking through this. In 1959, there were 12 teams. And so a couple guys, Lamar Hunt and Bud Adams, they wanted to buy one of the teams, the Chicago Cardinals, and they wanted to move it to Texas. But the NFL denied their request. They then asked to expand the 12 team um, regime to add another team. The NFL denied that too. And so that became some of the underlying 
pressure that was being brought to bear to sort of continue to look at what is going on with the NFL and is there an antitrust situation occurring. And, and what came out of that was these guys decided to form the AFL. And this was the newest incantation of the AFL. There had been some prior versions of the AFL in the prior decades, but they reformed the American Football League. And in, in 1960, they started with eight teams and they got an ABC TV contract. And that, of course, then prompted the NFL to want a better TV deal, and the NFL went to CBS. Now, this brings us on our next slide to the first case. Um, and this is sort of, we'll, we'll step back to 1953 to understand what was going on as you have this sport in America being played that was starting to be picked up on television as television grew and the national broadcast um, networks grew to facilitate the beaming of images into people's homes, obviously. And so the first case that was brought by the United States is in 1953. And this is the case entitled United States versus NFL. It's reported at 116 F SUP 319. It's in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania in 1953. And it was before a judge named Judge Grimm. And so the underlying situation is as follows. The NFL was dealing with this growing TV medium. And the NFL decided that they would limit the breadth of TV broadcasts that could be played by any one team. And they wanted to keep games being broadcast in particular markets and not out of market into other teams' home territories. Um, and so they actually adopted a bylaw to accomplish this. And this is Article X of the bylaws of the NFL at the time. And it provided that no club shall cause or permit a game in which it is engaged to be telecast or broadcast by a station within 75 miles of another league city on the day that the home club of the other city is either playing a game in its home city or is playing away from home and broadcasting or televising its game by use of a station within 75 miles of its home city unless permission for such broadcast or telecast is obtained from the home club. And so the Department of Justice sued and they argued that the restriction on live broadcasts being beamed into other home territories violated Section 1 of the Sherman Act. And so let's, you know, drill down a little bit on our next slide here. You see our facts, and I keep up in the, up in the um, top right-hand corner of your screen the Section 1 of the Sherman Act so that you can constantly keep it in your mind as we stay focused on what's occurring here and whether we have a Section 1 violation. Now, number one, the bylaws were agreed to by all the league teams. So that's, a de by definition, a contract under Section 1. And what, the, what Judge Grimm, looking at this, concluded is that Article X fundamentally prevented the telecasting of outside games into the home territories of other teams on days when those teams were playing at home. It prevented the telecasting of outside games into the home territories of other teams on, when they were, on days when they were playing away from home and permitting the telecast of their games into their home territories so that they could sort of maintain, you know, if you're the New York team that always on the, on the days you're playing either at home or away, only you can be watched by the local people of New York. Um, it prevented the broadcasting by radio of outside games into the home territories of other teams, both on days when the other teams are playing at home and on days when the other teams were playing away from home and are permitting the games to then be broadcast or televised into their home territories. And ultimately, the NFL structure, this Article X, gave the football commissioner an unlimited power to prevent any and all clubs from televising or broadcasting any or all of their own games. So on the next slide, um, we look at our antitrust analysis. And so Here's where it becomes particularly interesting because the nature of what the market was and was being defined at was changing because of technology. And this is one of the underlying themes that we'll see popping up throughout today on football. And it's obviously one of the underlying themes that animates all antitrust law in terms of as technology changes, our concept and our conceptualization of markets may change. And that, of course, then alters an analysis for antitrust purposes. But in any event, in 1953, before Judge Grimm, the Judge Grimm concluded that the market for the public exhibition of football no longer was simply limited to spectators who attended the games physically. And so whereas in prior decades, the market would be, you know, a physical stadium in a physical location and the people who could or would attend that, you know, physical geography. Now, because of the advent of television and radio, 
the visual and oral projections of football games can be marketed anywhere in the world where there are television or radio facilities to transmit and receive them, as Judge Grimm found. And so when a football team, he indicated and concluded, agrees to restrict the projection of its games into the home areas of other teams, it thereby cuts itself off from this part of the potential market. And so what Judge Grimm concluded is that, yes, a restraint on trade existed by virtue of this Article X contract that all the teams had agreed to as part of the NFL. And therefore, he concluded that a rule of reason had to be applied to assess whether this restraint was reasonable or unreasonable. And so as we look here on the next slide at the rule of reason analysis, we find that Judge Grimm held that the NFL was a genuinely unique business. And so it could indeed have some amount of reasonable restraints on trade. But what he also held is the bar on individual teams from selling broadcast rights to competing networks when the home team is playing away was unreasonable. So he found that bar to be an unreasonable restraint on trade, and so that would trigger a violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. But what he also held is that the NFL's Article 10 bar on broadcasting a foreign game into a home territory when the home team was playing at home was reasonable. It was not a bar to competition, and it was actually grounded in a legitimate business basis for the underlying teams. Attendance at home games could be defeated by other games viewable on air, and this was crucial because most of the revenue at that time still came from gate receipts. And so he concluded that that kind of a restraint was a reasonable restraint, even though it did limit um, you know, access by consumers and others to the viewing of the game. It was necessary and, a, and a permissible under the antitrust laws, at least in 1953. And so in that sense, the NFL won on part and they lost on part. Now, in 1961, as we fast forward a little bit, you remember that you know by now, the NFL has competition from the AFL. The AFL's got its contract for broadcasting. The NFL now wants to sort of up the ante with better broadcasting. And so the resolution of that first case before Judge Grimm had led to a, you know, a consent decree issued by the, um, signed by the judge and approved by settlement between the NFL and the Department of Justice. But now the Department of Justice triggers a second case and it goes to Judge Grimm again. And there's a picture of Judge Grimm. He doesn't actually look particularly grim. He looks like a very you know, mild-mannered, nice guy to me if you ask me. But he's, it's interesting because I think the NFL felt at some level that Judge Grimm was pretty grim for them. So in 1961, here's what happened. The NFL wanted to sell these pool, pooled broadcasting rights to CBS. And what the pooled broadcasting rights were, were all the NFL teams had agreed by way of the NFL rules that the broadcasting rights to the games that would be played on, you know, would be videoed and um, broadcast from their stadiums, would be pulled together and would be sold to um, CBS on an exclusive basis for two years. CBS would at the time then pay an annual license fee of almost $5 million. It was about 4.7 million, um, which would be divided equally among the then 14 teams. Now, before this contract, what had happened is that each member club individually negotiated and sold the television rights to its games to sponsors or telecasters with whom it could make satisfactory contracts. But new pooled CBS deal now meant that each team could no longer sell TV rights on an individual basis. Um, and so this contractual pooling of rights um, as opposed to any individual ability of a single team to, to sell on whatever terms it wanted is what had prompted the Department of Justice to come back to the table. And so here's what Judge Grimm held in a very short opinion. Um, what he held is that clearly this provision restricts the individual clubs from determining the areas which telecasts of games may be made. Since defendants have by their contract given to CBS the power to determine which games shall be telecast and where the games shall be televised. I am therefore obliged to construe the final judgment, that's the one from 1953, as prohibiting the execution and performance of the contract dated April 24th, 1961 between the NFL and CBS. And so Judge Grimm then struck down that NFL-CBS contract leaving the NFL in a big quandary. It needed that vast amount of money that it could get from CBS with the pooled deal to be then shared among the teams in order to sort of then grow and continue to grow. And the consent decree and Judge Grimm's order, which now is actually pretty grim for the NFL, 
severely limited the NFL's ability to grow as the NFL fell. So the question then is, what did the NFL do? Well, they do what all organizations do when they don't like judicial rulings. They go to Congress. And so in 1961, we have lobbying. And what happened is, and it's particularly fascinating to, to witness the lobbying that happened here and, and ultimately the speed with which it happened. Judge Grimm's ruling banning um, the NFL from entering that contract with CBS was on July 20th, 1961. And so there was an immediate lobbying effort undertaken to essentially codify positive law um, to reverse Judge Grimm's ruling. And so the NFL went to a congressman named Congressman Seller, and he was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee on Antitrust and Monopoly. And Congressman Seller held one day of hearings starting on August 28th, this thing, within a month they were holding hearings. And within, after that one day of hearings, the House and the Senate had a bill put together. It had then managed to be voted on, it was passed, and literally on September 30th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy signed it into law, undoing Judge Grimm's ruling. And so there you see Judge um, John F. Kennedy's signature un undoing um, Judge Grimm's ruling. And it's pretty incredible to think that in three months, a judicial opinion was voided by, um, by the executive branch and by the legislative branch. I'm not sure lobbying works that fast today, even though I suspect they spend far more money today. But nonetheless, it's an, it's an example of the profound, uh, profoundly successful effect of lobbying. And so let's take a look at what actually happened. And what happened is John F. Kennedy signed into law what's known as the Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961. And it's codified at 15 U.S.C. 1291. And here's what the law actually says. The antitrust laws, as defined in Section 1 of the Act of October 15, 1914, and that act is referring, of course, to what we looked at earlier, the Sherman Act, Section 1. So the antitrust laws, specifically Section 1 of the Sherman Act, shall not apply to any joint agreement by or among persons engaging in or conducting the organized professional team sports of football, baseball, basketball, or hockey, by which any league of clubs participating in professional football baseball, basketball, or hockey, contests, sells, or otherwise transfers all or any part of the rights of such leagues, members, clubs, in the sponsored telecasting of the games of football, baseball, basketball, or hockey, as the case may be engaged in by or conducted by such clubs. And so it's a, it's a very profound statement in terms of positive law being enacted to say that that Section 1 of the Sherman Act that restrains, that renders void and illegal contracts that restrain trade, no longer applies to these professional sports leagues who are engaged in selling um, member, member clubs' rights to sponsor telecasting. So when it comes to sponsor telecasting contracts and deals and structures, the antitrust laws will not apply. And so let's take a look at what happened, because pretty, pretty quickly, in 1962, as you see on the next slide here, there is some litigation in, in the NFL that starts testing this antitrust exemption. And this is the case of Blach versus NFL, reported at 212 F SUP 319. And this comes out of the Southern District of New York, 1962. I think at this point, the NFL is probably happy that Judge Grimm didn't have the case because of his grimness for the NFL. But nonetheless, this case was in the Southern District of New York. And here are the facts. So the NFL had another provision in its um, contracts, and this was in a contract with NBC for a blackout rule for televising games. And so basically what NBC had agreed was that it would exclude from the national broadcasts the championship game within a 75 mile radius of where the home club was playing. So for example, if the New York team is playing in New York, then no broadcast can occur within 75 miles of New York. And the NFL argued this was expressly allowed by the antitrust exemption of the Sports Broadcasting Act. The plaintiff went into court arguing that this is unconstitutional since it applied only to the championship games. And it, the plaintiffs argued that, look, the airwaves are public property. And once the FCC gave access to the airwaves to companies like NBC, then they had to deliver equally to all through all outlets. And so what the plaintiffs basically argued were that, 
they were deprived of what they claimed were their Fifth Amendment constitutional rights to be able to access and observe the telecast in common with millions and millions of people who happen to be outside the 75 mile radius. And in other words, what they're saying is, those of us within the 75 mile radius can't all go to the game, and we therefore shouldn't be deprived of being able to witness the game over the public airways. And so this case is in New York, and here's what the New York um, District Court held. And again, it's reported at 212 FSUP 319 in 1962. And this is a quote. Undoubtedly, plaintiffs and millions of other football fans within the 75 mile restricted area eagerly desire to see Sunday's championship game in the comfort and warmth of their homes. But their preferences cannot overcome the right of these defendants as authorized by Congress to impose the local area restriction, believing as they do that it serves their economic interest, however ill-advised the public may view their policy. However, one may view the imposition of the blackout as a matter of public relations. Under the Congressional Act, the privilege and decision are the defendants. And so that's a win for the NFL and it's an early loss for plaintiffs seeking to challenge various aspects of the NFL's contractual arrangements with the broadcasters as we're now in the early 1960s where football's becoming even more popular. And that loss is a significant loss in the early days of the NFL after the Sports Broadcasting Act because ultimately what happened is that three month lobbying effort that resulted in the very important signature of President Kennedy really laid the groundwork for the NFL to become what it is today. Um, and I think most sports historians and legal historians um, on football all recognize that the Sports Broadcasting Act absolutely is root fundamental. It undergirds the NFL and what the NFL is today. This brings us to the 1980s where we have the famous litigation, which many of you may have heard of, between the USFL, the NFL, and which prominently dealt, dealt with one of the key witnesses, Donald Trump, who makes a star appearance in our football law case. So here are the facts. By the 1980s, the NFL is obviously the dominant football league in the United States, and there have been various other leagues over the years that have tried to pop up and compete all unsuccessfully, and it's still happening to this day, as, as those of you who are football fans know. But nonetheless, what we have is, the USFL forms, and it formed in the early 1980s. Donald Trump was one of the founding members among a, um, a bunch of other people who set out to create this new football league. And it was a spring league, so as to not compete with the NFL, which had historically been and continues to be a fall league. And so the USFL plays a couple seasons <clears throat> and um, as a spring league game. But after the second season, they filed suit against the NFL under the Sherman Act. And they basically claimed that the NFL had been pressuring networks not to broadcast USFL games. And the NFL had fundamentally, due to that coercive pressure, had restrained trade under Section 1 of the Sherman Act, and thus had an improper monopoly in the TV broadcast rights realm of football. And they asked for $569 million in damages. And the root argument of the USFL in this litigation was that the NFL fundamentally coerced the three major networks, NBC, CBS, ABC, into really not dealing with the USFL and a network contract to have broadcast games to all of the United States, you know, you know, on all the networks was fundamentally critical to even the existence of a league and the survival of a football league. There was no such thing, in other words, as a football league in the modern day, that is in the 1980s, if you don't have television, it's just the cornerstone of it. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. Now, here's what the NFL argued. The NFL argued, hold on a second. You were playing in the spring for your first couple seasons. You were growing and doing all right. And in your third season, when you filed suit, you moved to a fall league. Um, and so when you moved to a fall league, that's what destroyed your business and caused you to not succeed. It was because you are trying to compete against the better NFL, and the NFL has just got a better product, better set of you know, players, teams, whatnot, and you couldn't compete. And in fact, what the NFL argued was that even your own consultants, like McKinsey, the famous consulting company, had said, don't do it. The networks had told you, don't do it, but the USFL still did it. And so here's what happened. We have the case then of USFL versus NFL, as you see here on our slide, that ultimately gets reported in a lot of different decisions, but this is a great decision if you wanna really read the full, full history, which I can't give you today, 
you can read it at 644 F SUP 1040. And this is the Southern District of New York in 1986. And indeed, we could do a one hour program just on this case. It's incredibly fascinating as you read the various decisions pre and post trial that come out of this decision. And there's a lot that's been written um, in secondary sources by journalists, obviously, who heavily covered this because it was truly the most sensational trial in New York for 1986. And it was ultimately a 48-day trial with 7,100 trial pages. And Donald Trump, who was obviously in the 1980s, he'd written his famous book, The Art of the Deal. He was one of the most famous people in, in the United States. And he was sort of part of the New York is, of, um, you know, wealth, real estate establishment. He was a central player in the case, in the litigation. And so this case spends 48 days in jury trial, and then it ultimately goes to the jury. And here is ultimately what the jury concluded after hearing 48 days of evidence. And we're going to unpackage some of it after I give you the verdict, but you've got to have the verdict first to start unpackaging some of the fun stuff. The jury did actually conclude that the NFL willfully acquired and maintained monopoly power in a relevant market consisting of major league professional football in the United States. The jury also found that the NFL's unlawful monopolization of a relevant market had caused injury to the USFL's business or property. Now here's what the jury also found. And the jury also found that the NFL did not attempt to monopolize and that defendants' conspiracy to exclude competition and their network contracts were actually not unreasonable restraints on trade. And so it's a horrendous um, mixed verdict that ultimately, even though there's a technical victory on some things from the US for the USFL, resulted in a jury damages verdict of $1. And under the antitrust laws, you can treble the damages, and so the jury duly trebled it to $3. And giving the USFL a victory of sorts of $3, which ultimately was not a victory, it was the death knell of the USFL that, it, that folded as a result of it, um, as it had attempted to expand and you know, become a competing business. Now, post-trial, this is where a lot of the stuff gets interesting and a lot of <clears throat> the evidence that we as lawyers can look at comes out. Post-trial, the, the USFL argued that there was an inconsistency between the jury verdict and it simply made no sense. And on that point, the district court held that the jury's finding that the NFL did not attempt to monopolize a relevant market can be explained by the hypothesis that the jury found defendants liable for actual monopolization based on a determination that the NFL had unlawfully maintained monopoly power rather than it having unlawfully acquired such power. And so that hair-splitting distinction is what animated the district court to conclude that the jury was fine in how it came down, there's no violation of the Sherman Act, and that was the district court's holding. Now, this goes on appeal to the Second Circuit, and <clears throat> here again we have the decision reported at 842 F. 2nd, 335, 1335, sorry, in 1988. And here's what the Second Circuit held. There was ample evidence that the USFL failed because it did not make the painstaking investment and patient efforts that bring credibility, stability, and public recognition to a sports league. In particular, there was evidence that the USFL abandoned its original strategy of patiently building up fan loyalty and public recognition by playing in the spring. Faced with rising costs and some, some new team owners impatient for immediate parity with the NFL, and that was an unequivocal swipe at Donald Trump, who was a USFL team owner and wanted to be in the NFL and or be as big as the NFL in any event. The idea of spring play itself was abandoned even though network and cable contracts were available for the spring. Plans for a fall season were therefore announced, thereby making 1985 spring play a lame duck season. These actions were taken in the hope of forcing a merger with the NFL through the threat of competition in this litigation. And so the Second Circuit was animated by the fact that what was really going on here was a competitor who could perfectly compete by having a spring league with you know, in a growing sport in the spring, there was still demand for it, there were network contracts, and this, they were unhappy. They wanted to go to the fall, and the reason they wanted to go to the fall, a lot of the trial evidence showed, was that they wanted to force the, the NFL to merge with them, acquire them, and give them, and Donald Trump, of course, um, a great franchise. And the Second Circuit was not impressed, and so the Second Circuit held that that was the cause of your injury. It wasn't anything in particular that the NFL had done. 
And so we can continue on, and in the next quote on the second bullet point is at pages 1351 to 52 of the opinion. It's a fascinating opinion to read. Again, well worth reading if you're a football fan. The NFL introduced extensive evidence designed to prove that the USFL followed Trump's merger strategy and that this strategy ultimately caused the USFL's downfall. The merger strategy of Trump, the NFL argued, involved escalating financial competition for players, compensation, sorry, for players, as a means of putting pressure on NFL expenses. And so the USFL kept giving more and more money to players to attract them, to force the NFL to have to compete and offer more and more money to get the players. And that was part of their strategy, and that's why it started costing them more money. And playing in the fall to impair NFL, NFL television revenues, shifting USFL franchises out of cities where NFL teams played into cities thought to be logical expansion through this merger strategy, cities for the NFL, and finally bringing the antitrust litigation now before us. And so the Second Circuit was not impressed. And as we see on the next slide here, we have some fascinating um, snippets of testimony that came out in terms of how Donald Trump really was the central character in the trial um, in terms of the NFL's defense. Um, and it was sort of, a, ultimately, it was a, a two key witnesses summed up each position. One was Donald Trump on behalf of the USFL, and one was um, a man named Rizal, who was the NFL commissioner at the time, who was sort of the central witness for the NFL. And in many sen and, and to a large extent, even among the 48-day trial, it was a battle between Trump and Rizal. And so here's some sort of key stuff that came out at trial. Trump testified that Rizal and the NFL desperately wanted him in the NFL. Um, and Roselle testified the complete opposite. And so here's what Trump said at trial. Roselle told me I should be in the NFL, not the USFL. At some point he said I would be in the NFL, and then he would reiterate that the USFL was not gonna make it. And so Trump's basic narrative was that they were desperate for me, they wanted me, they thought that the USFL wasn't very good and I should be in the NFL. And here's what Roselle said. Trump came to me and said, I want an NFL expansion team in New York, period. And he said, and I'm quoting him here exactly, I would get some stiffed by the New York Generals, my team in the USFL. And what was fascinating is Roselle had contemporary, contemporaneous notes of all of his different meetings and conversations with Trump over the years. He was apparently a, um, a very um, cautious note taker, memorializing events and whatnot. And so he had these, these statements down as exact quotes, memorialized at least at the time as he claimed. And so ultimately what happened then, the jury, as you saw, concluded that, you know, there was nothing there, and as the Second Circuit heavily concluded, it was you know Donald Trump's merger strategy is, that was their undoing, and it had nothing to do with the NFL. And here's a fascinating quote from Jerry Argovitz, who was owner of one of the USFL teams, the Houston, the Houston Gamblers. Donald didn't love the USFL. To him, it was small potatoes, which is terrible, because we had a great league and a great idea, but then everyone let Donald Trump take over. It was our death. And there you can get the quote and some other great quotes um, in the Guardian newspaper lo located there. Now, let's, this brings us to the 1990s, and we are now in an era where television broadcast is changing. We're now in the era of satellite TV. And so we've gone from antitrust law attaching and addressing as we shifted from only watching games physically in person to television and radio. And you know, it's still the booming television business of the 1980s and network television as we saw in the Donald Trump case. And now we're confronting new technologies, which were satellite TV, which allowed people to bypass the networks and beam stuff into their homes via satellite TVs. And so and one of the cases here that was brought against the Dallas Cowboys by Shaw, and this is in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania um, in 1998, U.S. District Lexus 8896. Um, again, picking up on that old, old, old consent decree, um, the case is now um, sent to Pennsylvania. And here are the facts. There were about a dozen NFL games that, that are free to watch on broadcast TV. And what the NFL did was it sold a satellite TV package to get all the games. But that required a satellite TV dish and a yearly fee. And so the plaintiffs argued that this requirement to get the dish and pay the fee restricted options for fans who wanted to view non-network um, broadcast games and it artificially raised prices and reduced competition for those non-network broadcast games by restricting the output. And the Dallas Cowboys said that, look, we're completely exempt under the Sports Broadcasting Act from any antitrust inquiry. We have the right to enter these contracts. 
and satellite broadcasting is the same as sponsored television casting, which was the subject of the Sports Broadcasting Act. But here's what the district court held. The Sports Broadcasting Act did not pronounce a broad sweeping policy, but rather engrafted a narrow, discrete, special interest exemption upon the normal prohibition of monopolistic behavior. In the SBA, the NFL got what it lobbied for at the time. It cannot now stretch that law to cover other means of broadcast. Accordingly, I find that the defendant's conduct is not exempt from the antitrust liability under the SBA. So here's an example where we have a court in the 1990s now being unwilling to broaden the lobby for immunity for broadcast television to new forms of broadcast such as satellite. This was appealed to the Third Circuit, and the Third Circuit affirmed, saying that our review of the Act's legislative history also leads us to conclude that it clearly reflect, reflects Congress's intent and the NFL's express contemporaneous concurrence that the Act addresses only the sale of games to a sponsored television network. And so it was affirmed, and the Dallas Cowboys lost that one, at least for purposes of antitrust exemption. So that brings us from looking at the antitrust intersection of the law and football to personal injury and the intersection of personal injury and concussions and injuries and damage to the actual players in the league um, and how that intersects with the law. And so this really takes us all the way back to the early days of Teddy Roosevelt that we looked at earlier in the early 20th century to the early 21st century with a full century now of football and really significant, profound physical injuries to the players in the game. And so in 2012, there was a series of concussion litigation lawsuits that were filed by various NFL players. They were coordinated and consolidated in a multi-district litigation proceeding, again, in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania in 2020. Philadelphia is just the center of football, um, football litigation, as we've now seen. And the case is known as in Ray NFL Players Concussion Litigation. Um, it's reported, and there's hundreds of reports because this is a piece of litigation that went on for 10 years. But nonetheless, it's reported at 961 F sub second 708 if you want to look at the, the, the kind of the final decision that we're talking about here in terms of what happened. And so basically, you have in July of 2011, a series of retired NFL football players who were really suffering with significant debilitating injuries, um, atypical for their age and whatnot, seen as being a result of the repeat physical trauma and concussions suffered over the years of playing football. And so the first lawsuits then are being filed against the NFL, alleging that the NFL breached their duties to the players under the master contracts between the NFL and the teams and the players by failing to take reasonable actions to protect players from the chronic risks created by concussive and subconcussive head injuries. And they also argued that these risks were known to the NFL and they were concealed from the players by NFL um, behavior and knowledge. And so as a result of some of these early cases back in 2011, eventually there were over 4,500 um, former players that filed substantially similar, similar lawsuits. And those were what were ultimately consolidated into this class action. And after almost 10 years of litigation, by 2020, finally a settlement was reached after a months long litigation, um, many, many months. Of, litigate, of mediation, sorry, years of litigation and then months of mediation um, where ultimately a proposed settlement was reached whereby the NFL agreed that over 20 years there would be $760 million made available for distinct classes. And so these classes were created um, and structured based around injury and the level of impairment to assess how much money would be received for the players and, and the players' um, family members who suffered ultimately as, as a result of the injuries that befell the football players. And so there are different levels of neurocognitive impairments um, you know, that were rated as level you know, 1.5, level 2, um, you know, level 3, level 4, et cetera, with higher and higher levels. And so basically we have um, at the lowest level of neurocognitive impairment, there would be about $1.5 million if, if that was a level of um, impairment. If there was greater neurocognitive impairment than $3 million, if it reached Alzheimer's um, disease as formally um, recognized and um, adjudicated or concluded by a doctor, then it's up to $3.5 million. Parkinson's $3.5 million also. ALS would reach $5 million. And if there was death with um, you know, um, concussive and um, brain injury damage from 
um, from concussive injuries than $4 million. And so that's the, sort of the basic overarching structure. Now, after that settlement was reached, the district court signed off on it in 2020, some players came back to relitigate some of the issues. And, and it's, it's really fascinating because in 2022, what had been concluded was that the means of conducting dementia testing on the players was race normalized. And so this actually race normalization of looking at the dementia results of, on players, because it was race normalized, it worked statistically to damage black players in terms of making it harder to show they suffered brain injury in, in comparison to non-black players um, trying to show brain injury. And so they went back and the settlement was then revised in 2022 to allow retesting without the race um, norming of the testing so that benefits and injury levels could be properly assessed and then benefits granted and assessed properly. And so that's where we stand in 2022 in terms of the resolution of the significant concussion litigation. And as you see, it's a problem that's now plagued football for 100 years, starting with Teddy Roosevelt's early attempts to save the game, which he probably did and actually probably helped create the existence of the game as we know it. And now 100 years later, we've reached new settlements to, to help resolve and address better means of treating, addressing, avoiding concussions. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff in the settlement, of course, which will probably in the long run ultimately enable the game to become even more successful and last for another 100 years although none of us will be here to do the CLE probably. Now, let's take a quick little sidebar, and this is into baseball. Um, and this is a 1922 decision of um, Federal Baseball Club versus the National League. And the plaintiffs there made Sherman Act antitrust violations against the National League, which is t today the, um, national, um, the National Baseball League. Um, and basically what happened is the defendant was purchasing all the plaintiff's clubs or inducing them to leave, and so the plaintiff couldn't have a competing league to um, you know, the, National the National Baseball League of the time. Um, and so the plaintiff prevailed at trial and got an $80,000 verdict. And this ultimately goes up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court fascinatingly framed the issue as, as one of interstate commerce and asked the question of whether um, the business in which the defendants were engaged when the wrongs complained of occurred taken as an entirety were interstate commerce or more accurately whether the monopoly they had established or attempted to establish was, an, was a monopoly even within interstate commerce. And Justice Holmes wrote for the Supreme Court that the business is giving exhibitions of baseball, which are purely state affairs, and that's not a typo, that's how apparently the Supreme Court um, spelled the word baseball as two words back in the day. It is true that in order to attain for these exhibitions the great popularity that they have achieved, competitions must be arranged between clubs from different cities and states. But the fact that in order to give the exhibitions, the leagues must induce free persons to cross state lines and must arrange and pay for their doing is not enough to change the character of the business. Accordingly, Major League Baseball is not even within the Sherman Act because it's got nothing to do with interstate commerce. An incredibly broad decision when you think about the things today that, are, that allegedly touch interstate commerce for, pur for purposes of Congress's legislation. Um, I suspect if I sneezed, you could somehow can conclude that that touches interstate commerce, right? But in any event, baseball um, was exempted completely from the Sherman Act on that basis. So in 1972, this goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court again affirms in another opinion, which is a fantastic opinion to read. It shows some very unique place that baseball has in the Supreme Court's heart. It's the love affair of SCOTUS and baseball, I guess. Where SCOTUS said in 1972 that the immunity may be, quote, unrealistic, inconsistent, or illogical, end quote. I mean, like, you think, right? But because it's obviously an interstate commerce, but nonetheless, um, we're going to let it stand. If this is to be fixed, Congress should fix it. And that's what the Supreme Court said in 1972. Now, finally, in 1988, Congress said, okay, we're going to remove the antitrust exemption from baseball, but only for issues relating to the employment of um, Major League Baseball players. And so as it stands, even today, you can't explain it or make it up. It's America's favorite pastime, I guess. In some sense, it's got to be more important to us as a people than football because baseball, as you see in our sidebar, holds a really special place in antitrust law in America's heart. Now, let's pivot here a little bit from antitrust to right of publicity. And we're going to conclude today's program by taking a look at name, image, likeness um, and the rights for college football and, and really all college athletes, but we're going to focus on football since this is football law. 
And this is a way of talking about right of publicity law. And so what we're going to do is a brief overview of right of publicity law. And we're going to then look at how the NCAA, through its long-standing rules, has long denied student athletes the right, actually, to monetize their right of publicity, their name, image, or likeness. It wasn't something they could monetize, and the universities got to monetize it. And so we're going to look at how this is then applied to college football over time and what the state of the law is today, because it has been through, for football law at least, and for all sports law, when it comes to right of publicity for name, image, image likeness, monetization of student athletes, see changes in the law in the 2020s. So let's get going with an overview of right of publicity law. You see here on the next slide, um, the basic issue in terms of what, what is right of publicity is it's a right to, of every person to ultimately com control the commercial use of his or her identity your name, your image, your voice, your likeness. And that right to control the commercialization of it, to make money off of, if you're a great, got a great voice for commercials, you've got a great look for whatever, your ability to monetize that is an intrinsic right of your own. Now this right doesn't come from the constitution, it comes from statutory or common law in many states. Um, but not all states have given this affirmative right through either common or statutory law, but most states have. And it's ultimately, it's an intellectual property right, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area of intellectual property law that, that fundamentally protects against this unauthorized taking of um, your name, image, or likeness for commercial gain. And these rights, they vary from state to state. They can last from 10 years to 100 years. Some even last post-mortem. It just depends on the jurisdiction. And one of the big issues really touching intellectual property law today when it comes to this is the fact that we don't have a uniform set of rights. And there is, is very good argument um, that really Congress at some point needs to create a national right of publicity law, just like it has for patent and copyright, um, so that we have some uniformity brought to bear across all jurisdictions with you know, protection for everyone. But in any event, one of the things we can look at is sort of where does this right come from at common law before legislatures even codified it? And ultimately, it was fascinatingly first conceptualized by um, Justice Brandeis in a law review piece in 1890 in the Harvard Law Review. And it was then existed in common law and ultimately codified. And it was actually addressed in a Supreme Court case in the 1970s that added a constitution, for the first time, a sort of a constitutional overlay to this right. And so this is a case of Zucchini versus Scripps Howard Broadcasting Company in 1977. And basically, the case involved um, a cannonball performer. He would be launched out of a cannonball. This is sort of Mr. Um, Zucchini. And Zucchini had this act he did, and the whole act was being a human cannonball. And a reporter brought, recorded the whole act and then broadcast it on TV without his consent. And so he brought a claim under Ohio's right of publicity law saying that you abridged my persona. My name, image, likeness is myself going out of a cannonball, and I have to monetize that by charging people to see it, and you don't get to video it and show it for free. And so he sued and argued his rights were abridged. And the reporters claimed that the Constitution protected their rights to, as news providers to show this footage that they shot. And the Supreme Court said no, that the, the um, First and Fourteenth Amendments of the Constitution didn't um, you know, give you carte blanche to do that and didn't prevent the performer from um, protecting his right of publicity. And so that opened really the floodgates to allowing people to protect their rights of publicity under state law in various jurisdictions. And so if you want to take California as an example, as you see on the next slide here, it's an exemplary um, you know, standard um, codified at California Civil Code 3344, protecting against the unauthorized use of name, voice, signature, likeness. And basically what it requires is, is there a knowing use of someone's protected identity? Was the use for advertising purposes? Was there a direct, direct connection between the use and the commercial purpose? And that's the basic um, cause of action that we look at when we're talking about right of publicity um, for plaintiffs. And so let's just take a quick look at a, Van, a famous Vanna White case. And there you see a picture from the case of um, a robot of Vanna White that Samsung used in an ad. And they put her this robot in a wig and jewelry, but it's kind of a robot evocative of Vanna White in, in the role she plays in um, the Wheel of Fortune game. Um, they didn't get her permission, but they used it in the ad. Vanna White was not impressed, so she sued. This goes up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit held that 
Television and other media create marketable celebrity identity value. Considerable energy and ingenuity are expended by those who've achieved celebrity value to exploit it for profit. The law protects the celebrity's sole right to exploit the value, whether the celebrity has achieved her fame out of rare ability, dumb luck, or a combination thereof. Because White has alleged facts showing that Samsung and, and Deutsch, the other defendant, had appropriated her identity, the district court erred by rejecting on summary judgment White's common law right of publicity claim. And so White was able to state a, a right of publicity claim. And so now the question then is for our sports athletes. Obviously, for professional athletes, they've always been protected like, like Vanna White and others, um, long able to protect their right of publicity when it comes to commercial exploitation without their permission. But what about our student athletes? And that brings us to the end of the program. This case goes to the SCOTUS in 2021, and it wasn't directly a student athlete name, image, and likeness case, but the case unequivocally has changed um, the playing field and did so immediately. And so basically, what happened is the NCAA had agreed to compensation limits for student athletes, and the NCAA enforced those um, rules on member schools. And so college football and basketball players sued. This goes up to the Supreme Court, who held 9-0, um, and here's what they said. Unlike customers who look elsewhere when a small van company raises its prices above market levels, the district court found that student athletes have nowhere else to sell their labor. Much agreed it is in unclear exactly what the NCAA seeks. To the extent it means to propose a sort of judicially ordained immunity from the terms of the Sherman Act for its restraints of trade on the student athletes, that we should overlook its restrictions because they happen to fall at the intersection of higher education, sports, and money, we cannot agree. And so that was in 2021, a profound decision, 9-0, slapping down significant portions of the NCAA rules, which they had sought to protect and immunize themselves from the antitrust laws, and the Supreme Court said, no, the antitrust laws are not going to protect you from that. What happened? Next slide, you see. One month later, with all this percolating litigation, the NCAA officially modified the rules delimiting students, athletes' ability to monetize their name, image, and likeness. So whereas before July 2021, students, student athletes could not at all profit off of their name, image, or likeness, now they can without limits. And so the entire range of the right of publicity based monetization rights that we looked at and talked about earlier, they're all open to student athletes. And so there you see a couple pictures of early student athletes, football players, one, um, the University of Miami um, quarterback signed with Hunks Hauling. You see him down there with a the big check to be a, um, a spokesperson for them. We also have the Clemson quarterback um, signed with Dr. Pepper. There you see him holding the Dr. Pepper. And this is now, you know, a, a massive, massive sea change in the law in terms of right a publicity law and where it intersects with antitrust law, enabling these student athletes to profit and monetize their name, image, and likeness in the time period where, which may be the only time period they ever have to monetize it because people are willing to pay value, value for it. So it's a massive, massive win for our student athletes. And it's a retreat, really, in terms of the scope of the antitrust um, you know, immunity that the NCAA had long sought. This brings us to our conclusions today. We've looked at the Sherman antitrust laws and the right of publicity laws through a variety of different cases, and we've seen how they intersect with football. And we've seen how ultimately that the National Football League and other national sports leagues really have a rarefied exemption for much of the Sherman Act. Very few of us get that kind of codified law exempting us from the Sherman Act. We certainly don't, but national sports do. And what we've also seen, though, is that there still can be antitrust claims brought based on anti-competitive conduct and how contracts may be structured or how restraints of trade may be engineered in terms of deals being su um, struck. But we see they're very, very difficult to push and they can be unsuccessful. Um, we see one exception with the Cowboys where courts have said we're not going to allow that sports broadcasting limitation to last forever in all mediums. Um, we've also seen the intersection of football law with personal injury law um, and these really important issues of um, settlements and, and settlement injury regimes, including sort of the, the race issues that intersect with them in, and then ultimately approval and monitoring by the district courts. And ultimately, we've seen the intersection of the antitrust laws and the right of publicity laws with student football players who can now monetize their name, image, likeness after the Supreme Court of the United States rejected really much of the NCAA's um, antitrust immunity claims, which then led, as we saw, to the significant NCAA revisions. Thank you for watching today's Curious Lawyer program. 
As always, if you have questions, please email. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.